Today we'll go through kind of all things electric vehicle charging and infrastructure and how you make your buildings ready for uh, this new stuff to come and the growth that we're experiencing in the uh, overall industry. EV overview, just to give you a quick example, there is over 65 different EV models now on the market today. Um, where the adoption is coming from is they look a hell of a lot nicer than they did back in 2012 when we first got into this thing. It wasn't the, the jelly bean uh, looking style. It's actually an actual vehicle now and an SUV. Um, by 2021, 2022, that's where I say Humpty Dumpty is going to fall off the wall and every manufacturer is going to have like three or four uh, different SKUs to, to select from, both from your standard passenger to your SUV style. Um, two types of vehicles, so full battery electric, 100%, there's no oil, there's no transmission, and then you have plug-in hybrid, which is both. You have a motor, you have a transmission, and then you have the battery side with an electric motor, okay? Both are kind of seeing similar adoption rates. Um, usually where people have that range anxiety of, I need to drive 600 kilometers a day, or I need to drive 1,200 kilometers on a weekend because I go to the cottage, a lot of them are adopting this, but after about four to six months, they kind of wish they went to this because they realized that they could have done exactly the same amount of commutes with a full-blown battery as they can with a gas car. And I'll get into to talking about that as we kind of go through the structures of what to think about when you're deploying. We have partnerships with literally every OEM. So when an OEM releases a new vehicle, about three to six months before they release it, we actually get it in our R&D center and we can do significant testing for their firmware based on our firmware. So when a vehicle is in the public setting, um, we can easily know the handshakes that the vehicles have to take. Um, and, and if they have to do anything in their updates, because they're manufacturing for worldwide, there's many different standards around, um, we can ensure that everything that lands in Canada is going to operate sufficiently across our network. The benefits of electric mobility, so a lot of people talk, it's clean, I get LED or lead, lead certification points. Um, it does reduce GHG emissions. It is smart from a, it's cheaper than gas and there's a lot less maintenance. I drive about five times the national average on a daily basis. I'm saving over $650 a month in gas and maintenance and I drive a 100% electric vehicle. Um, so there's significant savings there. Um, and that's why also fleets and workplace are looking at this at adopting it for their own business side of things because the savings is so um, efficient and they're enjoyable. So myself, the 600 kilometer side of things. It's silent, there's no vibration. I get in the morning and my car is completely warm. I am leaving a meeting, I turn on my car before I get in it and it's warm when I get, when I get in and it's ready to go. No vibration on the highway, so your stress levels go down. I'm always stressed, constant stress, and my EV has actually helped me with my stress, so it's like my kind of personal shrink. Uh, the electric vehicle market in Canada, so there's over 136,000 uh, EVs on the road. So this is both battery electric and hybrid. Okay. Um, year over year sales growth is 25%. That's going to continue to basically increase as more and more vehicles come out on the market. You saw Audi this year releasing their e-tron Mercedes, uh, in Q1, 2020, Q1 or Q2, 2020 is releasing the EQC. Um, so there's a number of new vehicles lined up. Literally every OEM is sold out of their vehicles and they haven't even delivered them yet. So they have hundreds of thousands of orders that are just waiting. Um, and that's kind of part of the issue, right? A lot of people blame the infrastructure. There's not enough infrastructure in the public eye to buy an EV when it's more, there's not enough stock to actually meet demand because people are really lined up for these things. Um, we have hit three and a half percent on ZEV share passenger vehicles. That's a big piece because the goal is basically 5%. Um, and we're already over halfway there, and that will be probably achieved by 2025. So those kind of goals that Natural Resources Canada and the governments have put in place, we're really, really close to hitting, and we'll probably exceed those as well. Primarily your market share right now, a lot of stock right now is going to Quebec and to British Columbia because of the incentives there. They have both provincial incentives and federal incentives. Um, here, it's kind of grasping at straws um, and, and really educating the investors and builders like yourselves and architects on um, designing the infrastructure in both, especially in new builds so you can plan for future, but also the retrofits and how you, you plan to increase over time as the building grows. EV charging, 
there is, we're, we're going to talk about really is um, two different modes, right? So you've got level two, which is called SAEJ1772. This is a universal connector. Battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids have the J1772 connector, okay? Um, that will put in about 35 kilometers of range on a full electric vehicle. On the Chevy Volt, for example, the, the um, hybrid, about 15 kilometers of range because it has a smaller onboard charger on the vehicle. Um, Shadamo and SAE, those are for DC fast chargers. Um, a lot of people talk about you need the fastest, fastest, fastest charger at your facility. So they're trying to sell a fast charger into multi-residential buildings. Um, you have to think about, and we'll get into it in a couple slides, how long people are parked for, okay? That's a massive amount of power. Every hour that a Tesla is plugged into a DC fast charger, it's pulling more power than five single family homes do in a week. Okay, so in one hour. So you think of the size and the scale that you need um, in market. And then Tesla has a proprietary adapter. So it's really similar to the Apple approach, right? Um, they're the only ones with a proprietary adapter, but every vehicle comes with an adapter that connects into the J1772. And then as a Tesla driver, you're seeing more and more Tesla superchargers getting deployed in like Cadillac Fairview shopping centers and other kind of destination locations. Um, so they plug in directly, but on our chargers, um, we have a, an adapter as well that goes into the Shadamo side. So Tesla can plug into basically any charger on the, on the market. So there are adapters now that have come out for um, a J1772 adapter to go into this and then plug into like a Chevy Bolt. Um, it's not recommended, right? Um, they're, they're third parties that are making them and there's a lot of power and a lot of heat going through these things. So we'll see how long they last. Um, but Tesla can do some stuff to kind of turn that off. So there's actually three levels of charging. There's level one, level two, and fast chargers. Level one is basically your standard wall outlet, okay? This charger comes with every EV or battery electric and plug-in hybrid. Um, it comes with the vehicle, okay? This is your, basically your trickle charge. So what we see when a person buys an EV from an OEM is um, they first rely on the level one and within three to six months they move to a level two installing at their home. Reason being is because of the range, about six kilometers of range in the battery. If you're charging outside in the winter, it's basically about two kilometers of range every hour, right? Because it's focused actually on warming the battery, which we'll, we'll talk about. So there's some different sciences to um, charging. Level two is your most standard. So level two is gonna be the stuff that you're deploying in your multi-residential buildings, you're deploying in your workplace side of things. This is where a lot of the government funding is coming from to deploy infrastructure is on level two. That'll put about 35 kilometers of range per hour uh, that you're connected in. When you factor how far the average driver drives, they drive 45 kilometers a day to and from work. And that hasn't changed in 100 years. So that means basically two hours connected into this and they've brought back their range in more than double the capacity to get back home as far as the, the charging goes. So you have to think about a person's kind of commute and styling and how long we've had that for. Instead of thinking, I need a massive, massive battery that can take me six, 700 kilometers, it's completely out the window after your, like your first two, three months of, of driving an EV. It really changes your mindset. Fast chargers, up to 250 kilometers of range per hour. You're seeing Tesla superchargers, which are like 300 kilowatts. That'll put in almost 1,000 kilometers an hour. Porsche the same way. Um, but again, massive amounts of power. That 1,000 that kilometer of range per is taking on more than 20 single family homes in a week. So you see the difference in the strain on the utility side. If you ever do deploy a DCFC, do not do it without talking to the utility first. Okay, and making sure that the infrastructure is there because there is so much different aspect to deploying a DC fast charger than a level two. So um, in market average for level two is about $1.50 an hour. Okay, um, on DCFC in Ontario, we're charging $20 an hour. Okay, but that's billed to the second. Okay, so all of the pieces are billed to the, to the second because you don't sit on a DC fast charger for an hour. Um, if you do, it's probably your first or second time that you've connected in and you don't realize that after the first 20 minutes, that level of charge is kind of going down to level two. So now you're just giving me free money, okay, to, to take. So the average user is parked on a DC fast charger for 18 to 21 minutes in warm months and 25 to 30 minutes in cold months. Okay, and we'll get into that reasoning in a, in a couple of slides. 
So this, this side is really going up in speed, right? Um, it's more of a people feel that I need the fastest, fastest thing, but we'll talk about the reasons why it's not necessarily that. The $1.50 is, is the price in, in Canada, across Canada, you, you can't charge by the kilowatt hour for EV charging right now because you would need a Measurement Canada approved, uh, basically, um, license, right? So the way to do that is now you're providing a service instead, either by the hour or by the session, okay? Um, you're still paying your kind of standard utility rates, okay? So on-peak, mid-peak, off-peak. It can be 12 cents, it can be 30 cents. It really depends on what kind of billing bracket the, the building is in. Um, in many cases, you'll see us at, at a lot of Canadian tires. We're at over 21 Canadian tire locations right now. I have a separate meter running each one of those DCFCs. So I have separate accounts running each one of those DCFCs to keep me under the next uh, billing bracket and underneath that 50 kilowatt threshold to go into demand charge. Because if I put these on a, a, on a same meter, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get a bill for $1,500 in overage demand charges for the first vehicle that plugs in. How do you make money back on that, right? Um, so there's a lot of different, different pieces. Your average, when we're collecting the $1.50, we remit back 85% to the site owner or the charger owner when it's in like a public setting or if it's in visitor parking at, at your locations. Um, you can do a few things from the dedicated parking side for actual uh, condo owners on like a monthly basis, kind of treat it like almost like a cell phone plan or a, or a cable, cable plan, right, an internet. The mentalities are completely different too. Um, so a lot of people compare this stuff to gas, right? Where we drive, we fill up maybe one or t two times a week, um, we have to go to the gas station, you wake up in the morning and you're like, crap, I forgot to fill up the night before, I've only got a quarter tank and I've got to get on the road. That gets out the door with EV. So over 65% of charging is done at home overnight, right? So single residential who have driveways have an extreme benefit, right? Because they have a charger directly there and that's the headaches that you guys are going through on figuring out how to get chargers to each one of the, the tenants' parking spots as well. Um, when that happens, what happens is the charging is done overnight over across longer periods of time, so you need less power, right? So there's less strain on your overall asset, less strain on the grid, but every morning I get into my car and I have a full battery. So it's a very different mentality. Whether I have, I've only used 40 kilometers or I've used the 450 kilometers on my battery and arrive back home, I have a full battery in the, the next morning. I never have to go out and hit a charger. We fulfill, um, basically three kind of pillars. It's what we focus on, we don't focus on anything else. We're not doing bus charging, we're not doing heavy duty charging, we're solely focused on passenger vehicles. That's our mandate. Our mission basically is to make this stuff hella simple. Okay, both for the driver and for you guys that are, that are deploying this stuff. It's not about mass, mass, mass. We're about making it easy because right now in the industry, it can be a little daunting for EV drivers and especially you guys who are, who are de deploying. So um, we have products for at home, in the workplace and on the go. And that's more of like those Canadian Tire examples, the Cadillac Fairview examples. We'll get into, it, into those examples as we go. I mentioned the 63% is done at home, 19% at work, 18% on the go. This time last year, it was 80% at home, so single residential. Where the shift happened was workplace grew significantly because of all the incentives that are now going in place for workplace funding. Okay, so the provincial government before uh, the Liberals were booted out, they had a fund for workplace charging that was $5,000 per charging station, um, and they would pay up to 80% of that overall cost to a max of $5,000. Um, they deployed over 600 chargers in that, in that program. That program was basically fully subscribed to within 48 hours here. So it was a huge success. Um, the, the Entercan funding that I talked about before we started that will be coming out, the way that they do it is they do it through an RFP. So you fill out an application, you submit it, they take usually 30, 60 days on the approvals and then write the contracts with you and you start delivering the, the stations. But so with that new funding coming out for MERB, this is gonna change again significantly. At home is gonna go back up because now it's gonna allow people easier ways to charge their vehicle because they're also working on some legislation where potentially um, uh, spots can be easier moved when it's in the deed 
or also deploying into more shared spots with the legalities of not allowing owners to park in like shared visitor spots or common area spots. They're working on a number of different structures, which is why they haven't released a fund yet for MERB because there is so many different things that you have to take into account. I, I mentioned that we'll talk about the benefits of level two charging. Level two charging is the only one that will do battery management for a vehicle. Level one doesn't and DC fast charging don't. Um, we call this stuff EV charging stations. It's not a charging station. It's actually electric vehicle supply equipment. The charger is actually on the vehicle itself. So the, the vehicle is actually the brain to this. And what's happening on level two is a lot of people compare batteries to their cell phone, completely different tech. Sure, it's lithium ion, but it's completely different tech inside. So when you're connected into a level two charger, what it's doing is it's managing the temperature of the battery because there's a lot of heat that actually happens with it. And it's also um, structured so the vehicle onboard charger is actually looking at the cells in the actual battery and saying, okay, I have weak cells here. I need to focus on building those back up to full health. So over time, the more you're connected into a level two charging station, the more optimization the onboard charger is actually doing to the battery to always keep it at full health. You see degradation really stopping at like 95%. Of a, of a degradation, so you're losing only 5% of the battery life because of the level two side of things. So less than 1% of batteries on EVs have ever been replaced because of an issue with a battery. It's usually an issue with like a cooling system or something else. The tech is, is significant in, in EVs. Where stuff is different is how OEMs think about um, protection from a warming capacity. So you'll hear uh, the Chevy Bolt. When the Chevy Bolt was first released, we were getting phone calls off the hook when people were connecting into our DC fast chargers. They're 50 kilowatts, but they were connecting in and only getting 25 kilowatts. And they were saying, you guys are reducing your power rate, but you're charging me the exact same price. But how Chevy manages their optimization is as a security blanket in their tech, they want to warm the battery up to a certain level, no matter how long you've been driving for before it allows to increase the capacity of the kilowatts delivered, right? Because the battery is wanting to protect itself. So on a DC fast charger, if you connect in that full 18 to 20 minutes, after that, when a car approaches 80% of its charge, like of its, of its full battery, that onboard charger starts to say, okay, EV, SE, I want you to slow down because I'm going into battery protection mode and I want to optimize and keep safe. That's why you disconnect, right? Instead of staying on that level three and paying the $20 to me in, an hour because you're pretty much at level two standard. And we get a lot of calls in that way. We have a 24-7 uh, customer service support team um, that we actually educate EV drivers on what to do and what not to do. Um, and our number one call center into our, drive, er, into our call center right now is, I'm a brand new EV driver. I don't know anything about this. Wasn't taught at the, at the dealer. They don't even know where their charge port is on their vehicle to connect in, right? So we take them through that whole entire process. Um, it's also preheating and cooling. So again, in the morning when my vehicle turns on, it turns on 10 minutes before I get into the car. Uh, while it's preheating, it's actually using the power through the charger and not using the power from the battery. Okay, so that optimization again is how you increase range. Everybody talks about I lose 50% 50, 50 of range in, in winter months. The reason is because they connected in when they got home at six, their car was done charging at 12 midnight, and now it's sitting from midnight to six or 7 a.m. and the battery's getting cold again, right? And then when you get back in, what the car is doing is it's saying, okay, I need to warm myself back up. I need to get my battery optimal. So it's taking energy from the battery to warm up that battery. Then it's taking energy to warm up the cab, and then it's taking energy to drive, right? So this is where you really want to think about speed of charging, and it's not necessarily fast, 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 but how optimal you can do it for how you're driving. About flow and add energy, so um, we are a truly vertically integrated company. So flow is what the EV driver knows. It's the brand that's in, um, in, in front of them when they're pulling up to the stations. Uh, we're the largest network operator in Canada. Uh, we are 100% Canadian owned and operated. I'll get that in, in, the, in the other piece. But think of us, like think of flow as like Bell right? For your, for your cell phone and for your internet, right? We're the brand. And then Ad Energy is actually the manufacturer of the charging station. So that's where the vertical integration comes through. We're a manufacturer. We manufacture in Shawinigan, Quebec, and um, we run the, run the networks.
Ad Energy, we've been around since 2009. Uh, Quebec City is our headquarters. Our R&D is in Quebec City, and our manufacturing center is in Shawinigan, Quebec, about an hour kind of northeast of, of Quebec City. Um, the charging solutions for all market segments, again, that's that kind of three pillars, but we'll get into that and expand it a little bit. What makes us the largest network across Canada is we run flow, but we also run branded networks for various utilities. So Electric Circuit, which is the largest branded network in Canada, um, is owned and in, in, in run basically by Hydro-Quebec, but it's our, it's our backend and hardware um, that they've rebranded. Uh, we do the same thing with the eCharge network, which is in New Brunswick, and we've just recently taken over the BC Hydro network um, um, to control and optimize their solutions. So as an EV driver, um, you know Flow very well because you've learned about them from when you were purchasing the vehicle. We have partnerships with Volkswagen, Nissan, Mercedes, and, and others, um, and then it goes into the actual stations. So we're a manufacturer, network operator. We're not an electrical contractor or a GC, so we don't do the installs ourselves. We do have partners that will install, um, but we're, what makes us most important and different is we're agnostic to the electrical contractor that you work with. So what a lot of times we recommend is utilizing the electrical contractors that you have on site because you'll save 30 to 50% on install from a civil and electrical works perspective. And we can work with them on if they have questions, if they haven't done it before, how to best optimize it. So that brings us to 25,000 charging stations across our network in, in Canada. Um, we touch over 95,000 EV drivers on a daily basis, whether that's at home or in public segments. Um, we've got 200 employees right now, or just over. We're growing at about 15 to 20 employees a month right now, so it's really rapid growth. Um, eight offices across Canada, and we've got three in the U.S. now. So 2018, we started approaching in the, in the U.S. after we kind of locked up Canada. We have 96% market share in Canada. Um, for, for EV stations. So designing EV charging stations. This is your most important thing to remember walking out of this room. Um, if you're gonna remember one thing, it is this. Um, and it goes back to that charging schedule and charging time. How long will a car be parked for? When you're designing something into your workplaces, into your multi-residential buildings, into your single dwelling um, lots, you wanna think about how long vehicles are parked for. Again, vehicles parked hasn't changed in 100 years, just like the 45 kilometers hasn't changed, right? So it's not about we have to wait till we get these massive batteries to be able to drive everywhere. It's how long you're parked for. In residential, multi-residential, eight to 10 hours. So that means I'm parked for so long, I'm only driving 45 kilometers. I don't even need the 30 amps that the level two charger provides to give me 35 kilometers an hour. I can go down to 15 amps. And from your retrofit building side of things, that means I can now get four chargers on one 40 amp breaker and share that power across to really increase the overall longevity. At work is four to eight hours. So again, as we're future proofing these pieces, again, we don't necessarily need the full power on the level two stations and we can optimize to again expand. Everything that we look at is about expansion, right? Because this stuff is not just gonna kind of flatline. The adoption of EVs is skyrocketing and it's gonna just continue to skyrocket as more and more stock becomes available. So you think about future proofing. I don't want you to deploy 20 stations at your property at once. I'd rather you deploy five and then when you see usage that's basically overwhelming those five stations, deploy more, but plan and build and run conduits that can take 20 stations, right? It's better from your investment side of things, it's better from your optics side of things, because if there are only four people charging on a regular basis and somebody else sees 15 more open spots that are charging, it's a negative aspect, right? It doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for us, it's, it's completely negative and completely counterintuitive um, to the investment. In public though, you're parked for four, one to four hours. One and a half to two and a half hours is our average on a level two public charging station. In public environments, this is where you wanna provide full power. So the 7.2 kilowatts in uh, level two or the 50 kilowatts in, in DC fast charging. In your visitor parking spots, you want full power, okay? In your residential or workplace parking spots, you can split the power, right? Because people, when they're in public settings, they're parked for that period of time, they're expecting full power, and that's where you can collect the full $1.50. Right? Because right now we can't build by the kilowatt hour, so a person that's getting only half or 25% of a standard charge rate and still paying $1.50, they kind of feel ripped off. 
right? Um, city curbside, if there's anybody in here from municipalities or regions or you design in for a lot of municipalities, um, curbside charging, we're one of the only manufacturers that have a specific charger that's been designed for parallel park locations. It's 12 feet high. Um, it's not in our booth downstairs because it's so high, but um, this charging station, we see the most amount of use out of any one of our level two charging stations in the market. Um, both from an area of if there's multi-residential buildings in and around the downtown cores or the city cores where those parking spots are, you see uh, a lot of those multi-res users parking here and charging even overnight because they can't yet have them in the, in the condo buildings or in the apartment buildings. Um, it also drives traffic in when you're out at special events or uh, looking to go to restaurants or public meetings. Um, so what we've designed, the reason why it's 12 feet high is no matter how a person parks in parallel parking, and we all park differently, some park, people can do it really, really well, and some people have the back tire up on the curb and other people have the front tire up on the curb, that 12 feet mast ensures that no matter where the charging port is on the vehicle they can connect in okay and then I mentioned DC fast charging 18 to 21 minutes in warm months 25 to 30 minutes in cold months um, and then you really want to basically move them out from from that aspect considerations in public um, all public ability to collect payment for charging is big in all public stations do not think of this stuff as offering it for free okay we are one of the only ones that say that I only make 15% on a transaction. That's basically covering the credit card transactions and processing. This is not a revenue generator for us, but when you do it for free, it promotes abuse and significant abuse, right? People will park for eight, 10 hours. They'll come to your public property at night when everybody is left, plug in. Our OEM dealers see it all the time. They put non-connected stations in outside and then within six months they call me and say, Brooks, I need a connected station because I've got this guy that plugs in and he walks down to his house and then comes back at 5 a.m. before my service guys get in and take his car home. So there's a lot of different, different aspects to that. Uh, station management and support, durability especially. So every, because we manufacture in Canada, what we obsess over is uptime and quality. All of our products are manufactured to last minimum seven to 10 years. Um, they're all aluminum enclosures. You'll see them in our booth at uh, booth number 413 in the right underneath us. Um, they can literally be taking a baseball bat to them and nothing happens to them um, because we obsess over, over that quality side of things. Uh, reliability and uptime, this is your biggest issue in the industry, is are the charging stations actually working when I get there? So you have a mobile app that you can see, um, are the charging stations in use, are they down, are they out of service? The number one pain point is not range anxiety uh, as an EV driver. That goes out the door within 30 days. What the range anxiety is, is I'm planning to drive 150 kilometers, I know there's a charging station there, is it actually going to be working when I get there? And that's what we obsess over, um, is making sure it works there. We have our own service crews that constantly go out and manage and, and operate the stations and maintain them. Because level two is kind of set it, forget it, walk away. But DC fast charging needs to be maintained at minimum once a year. Um, and then twice a year, three times a year, because there's so much more going on in those um, oversized, oversized chargers. Uh, Multi-res and condo, um, so it's definitely very, very similar, right? But it's a future-proofing aspect. Right? So how, what, how much power do I need to pull into my building and how far can I stretch that capacity when adoption continues to grow? That's your primary. BMS is another uh, key piece. Um, and then it's overall, how the heck do I do this and get around the condo and strata councils and the boards and how do we get it all approved to actually be able to do it? That's part of the reason why Enercan hasn't released a fund yet for, for MERB is because they're still figuring that out. Right? As, as, a, as a personal kind of thing from a company side, we focus right now very little on MERB just because it is such a nightmare from the, especially the retrofits side of things, from the board side of things. It takes six, eight, 12, 24 months before anything happens. That's what we're excited about from the Enercan side is hopefully they're gonna help a lot of that stuff out and break down a lot of those barriers to make it a hell of a lot easier for you guys to do this. But when you are selling new builds, what a lot of builders are doing is they're selling a charging station at a parking spot for like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, right? That's what you wanna to get to. Right? Is, is that piece when you're, when you're selling granite countertops and upgrades, that's what you want to get to. And it's very simple for you to do, but working with the, working with the utility is, is key on, on multi-res. Uh, workplace and fleet, again, super similar to condo. So infrastructure and future proofing always comes down to it. Station management and support. Um, 
the majority of those 25,000 charging stations are connected to our network operations center. We run that 24 seven, so we're constantly watching what's happening with stations. Are we seeing issues? Are we seeing similarities to issues? Are we seeing cars that are plugging in and they're not charging or they're disconnecting? Um, we can do basically 90% of issue fixing over the air through firmware updates. Okay, so that's part of the benefit of us manufacturing and running the network is we have so much more um, intellect, in, in infrastructure into the actual stations that tell us what we can fix and what we can't fix. Or do we need to deploy a, a, uh, a tech? So let's get into the products. Um, we, don't, we don't basically use um, a same product for multiple different segments. So we actually have a product specifically designed for single residential. Again, it's level two uh, product. Our core plus unit for multi-res and workplace. It's been specifically designed for multi-res workplace and fleet applications. Our smart two, um, which is more public, high vandalism prone areas. Uh, we'll get into, into that. The DCFC, it's not the sexiest looking thing, right? Um, it looks like a fridge, but it has the highest uptime in the industry. Your average uptime on DCFC is lower than 80%. Ours are three nights, okay? So again, going back to that uptime perspective, it's not sexy, but it works and it lasts and it stays operating in any, any condition. Um, and then we go into the 12 foot high mast. What we're seeing a lot of developers, commercial developers, are wanting this station because the parking lots are getting so big being 12 foot high, you can see exactly where the station is, so it's easier to drive to, instead of a typical station, which is about five and a half feet high. Okay, so very different kind of cases. We're installing a lot of them between the dividing lines of the, of the parking spots. So from the Core Plus, um, and please come down and, and, and take a look at it. Um, like I said, applications, apartment buildings, condominiums, commercial properties, you can install them. Um, they are more, to, more affordable, but you want to put those into commercial properties which really don't experience a lot of vandalism. Okay, because the cable and connector, it doesn't have a locking system on it. Okay, um, so you do get some vandalism. Um, more so in the early days, we see very little vandalism now, even on the, the vandalism side of things. So it is, people are just now walking by them. They're not really even looking at them anymore um, as, as vandal pieces. Um, workplace, we have, um, I would say probably the widest network of, wor of workplace charging in fleet parking lots. Um, and we'll get into reasons why these are getting adopted for that. Um, I mentioned, so everything is on a 30 amp uh, charger. So it's either at 208 uh, volt or 240. Okay, so it can work on, on both. Um, all of our casings are NEMA 4X, so aluminum casings um, down to minus 40, up to plus 50 as far as environment. So install I indoors, install outdoors, install in water, wherever you want to go with this thing, it, it, can, it can be installed. Um, super, super rugged. Um, adjustable output current, so again, like you asked as far as the, the output currents, these can be adjusted down to as little as 6 amps all the way up to, to 30 amps. So we can play with the power based on the requirements of the, of the actual building. Um, the cascading kit is, is, a, is a big piece. Um, when you're mounting in a, in a pedestal or in multi-res, uh, what the cascading kit will do is it'll allow you to, let's say, run a 200 amp service into the first uh, pedestal and then daisy chain and cascade that after the fact to all of the rest of the units to simplify how much conduit you're running to the to the first unit and then easily expanding in the future so what typically most will do is go back to that kind of do five instead of 20 example they'll take the conduit out to a certain point cap it and it'll be ready there and then they tie into that station outside so they're not retrenching a new conduit into the building. So that's something to think about when you're, when you're actually designing this stuff into the infrastructure. Where issues happen the most on all charging stations is the connector head and the cable. So it gets snagged by snowplow drivers, um, it gets dropped, it gets abused, um, it starts to, uh, you know when you're plugging in your light in, your, in one of your socket switches and it's loose? That's from basically heat buildup over time and the resistors are just basically loosening up kind of like a spring does over time. Same thing happens in those. There's a hell of a lot more heat going on in, in these connectors, right? So you start typically seeing failures at 500 to 2500 sessions, okay, in those, in those connectors. Our connectors are rated for over 10,000 sessions. Okay, so again, a significant change. You can buy a charger for $350 to $600, a non-connected charger. To replace that cable costs $350.
So you can see the difference kind of in quality that, that we obsess over. We're more of the kind of premium play um, manufacturer because we do want this stuff to last and to be able to grow as, as the adoption continues. This is where we get into the different design options, right? So being modular, we can literally have wall mounts, wall mounted with cable management, single pedestal, dual pedestal. You can do back-to-back -back pedestal. So typically a dual pedestal will go on the dividing line of two side-by-side -side parking spots. You can take the exact same charger and make them back-to-back. -back. So now you can put it in the middle of two butt-end parking spots and expand it, right? Or on the, on the wall as well, or on a, on a pole, on a pilaster, um, on the support structure of the, the beams, whatever, whatever works. And they can all be turned around, like I said, suspended from the ceiling. So this is um, gonna be, a, a, uh, for the next couple of slides, we're gonna talk about power sharing and power limiting. So earlier, Brooks mentioned about infrastructure costs and future proving, which are very much related. And the way that we would uh, help you to achieve that is through power sharing. So power sharing would do exactly that. It would help you to reduce the infrastructure costs um, by using the idea that you can use whatever residual capacity that you currently have with your infrastructure. And then we would manage the load based on that amount that you already have without upgrading your electrical panel in the infrastructure. So we can do it at two different levels. On a higher level at the panel, where you have a dedicated panel. In this case, you would have individual breakers, 40 amp breaker each, because our uh, level two charger is at 30 amp, as uh, Brooks mentioned. So you can do that. One dedicated panel with individual um, disconnect uh, breaker at 40 amps. So in this particular case, what you're seeing is uh, you can have um, up to nine uh, individual uh, charging stations versus if you do it individually, only three. Now, if your infrastructure is a little bit more constrained, which means that your panel is already taken up by a lot of the other um, items uh, on, on the uh, system, what you can do is at a lower level, at the circuit level, you can do power sharing with one breaker. So with one 40 amp breaker, you can share up to three to four you know, uh, charger, charging stations. So this compares to only one charging station if you're using just a dedicated breaker. So one versus three, basically. The benefit between the two differences, so it comes down to, again, power, right? So if you're, if you're building a brand new building, the reason why we recommend going with a dedicated panel and individual breakers, the actual sharing is happening across the entire panel and across each one of those breakers. So when a car is done, it's able to now, we're able to now share more power to the individual breaker because of how CSA looks at protection levels on the 80% difference between your breaker level and what's coming through the charger. So you can work with more on the, on the power side of things in that aspect. So it makes sense to go with this and kind of overdo your infrastructure on new builds. On a retrofit, um, because you're typically more limited, if you've done LED upgrades and HVAC upgrades, typically we see buildings getting like 50% 50, 50 capacity back. Um, so adding to a single breaker, what happens is, uh, and we'll go through, if four cars are connected in, you're getting eight amp per. As if two cars are connected in, you're getting 16 amp. Okay, um, whereas in that same scenario, if only four cars were connected in, um, they're still getting that full 30 amp because they're on an individual breaker, right? So it's just basically how you can help basically your infrastructure upgrades. Um, and that can be done by the electrical contractor by assessing the uh, demand on the building through the utility uh, invoices. A lot of utilities, of course, have the engineers that can also look at the, the power infrastructure on the existing buildings and the power feeds, and we can know exactly how to, to manage this and operate it. So as vehicles connect in, right, what it's showing is the optimization between the actual breaker levels, and as more and more vehicles come in, it then changes and optimizes to ensure that the capacity is never over what is available at the actual panel level. For multi-residential, one of the biggest things to think about is do not allow multiple vendors, multiple hardware side of things into your building. Make it one. If you make it more, they don't talk necessarily to each other. Okay, so you can't protect as well. 
we all have power sharing aspects. Us, ChargePoint, uh, Switch, all of us have, have power sharing aspects. We actually have the patent on uh, power sharing, um, but keep it as a single provider in your multi-res building because that's gonna protect your asset longer over time. Okay, instead of letting it be a free-for-all and allowing tenants to do whatever they want at the panel, you'll take far too much capacity up. So where a lot of retrofits right now are having problems, they've allowed, let's say, the first Tesla driver to um, have, a, have, a, have a, a connection into their existing panel. What they've done is they put in a 60 amp or 80 amp uh, charger in that panel. Now the Tesla driver has three more individuals that have adopted an, an EV. There's no room at the panel, and the Tesla driver is not willing to give up his full 80 amp charge. Yet you've just taken yourself away from being able to deploy six to eight more chargers on that same feed. Okay, so don't give, don't give options. Make it, make it whole. Make it a consistent piece, and it will protect your asset at a, over a longer period of time. And this is the other piece uh, of our power uh, management uh, feature. So it's called a uh, power limiting. So the previous one where we have power sharing, that's more related to uh, helping you with the infrastructure costs and future proving. With power limiting, we're trying to improve the operating costs for you as, a, as an operator. So what that essentially means is we're able to set a maximum load, maximum current output for either uh, the individual charger or an aggregate of a number of core uh, plus chargers. So you can see from the graph, without the power limiting, you would see the peaks at certain times of the day. And that's where you would have uh, the demand charge, as uh, Brooks mentioned earlier. So um, there's four ways that we can uh, incorporate uh, power limiting. So the first way is uh, through a fixed amount. So one level uh, over um, the uh, entire uh, time of the day. Second one is uh, you can change that uh, throughout the different times of the day. So for example, if you uh, understand your profile and you would see that at 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock that's where the peak occurs you can actually just set the uh, power limiting for those couple of hours so you can do that. Third way is uh, as Brooks also mentioned uh, as well is through uh, incor uh, incorporating it in into the BMS so incorporating it into your building management system so that the uh, chargers from a BMS perspective is, is a single load so you can also uh, control your power limiting dynamically through the BMS using the uh, BAC net um, uh, protocol. And lastly, another way that we can uh, uh, incorporate power limiting is through an API. So um, for example, if, if you're working with uh, uh, the utilities, they would have the ability to send signals through their demand response program, for example, to dynamically uh, control the power limiting based on certain uh, schemes that they've set up with the, uh, the customers. So those are the couple of ways that power limiting could uh, help you uh, improve your um, operating costs. Let's say you only have a, a 100 amp capacity, right, in your building. We can say no matter how many charging stations have been installed, never deliver above 100 amp to protect the building load. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty easy way to, to understand it, uh, to get away from the kind of rocket science kind of piece. This demand response piece is super, super important as well. So the other piece to consider is this type of power sharing and power limiting has to have a connection back to like a network operations center, right, to actually do that. It's all software based, right? It's not done in the, in the hardware itself because each charger is talking to each other and then back to basically your, your home base to do that power management. Once utility catch up um, what utilities are able to do on their protection of the grid will be to say hey I'm seeing strain in uh, this locale so either a multi-residential building or um, a single res I'm seeing strain and it's usually between 7 and 10 p.m. when we're all home making dinner and doing our laundry and the peak load goes up for the utility to be able to say hey I need to limit the capacity that's going into the stations, I'm going to sum submit a demand response event to lower the power. And then when I see the power becoming back into more full capacity, then it can turn up again. So this is how a lot of utilities and us working together are protecting the grid assets. We have a lot of power available. Right. It's it's it, we're, Ontario is, is in a very, very good spot and the rest of Canada are in very, very good spots as far as um, deployments and the amount of energy and electricity that are available for charging stations. But we only have that. And we're only safe if we're deploying smart stations that can actually connect back to the utility. If it's dumb stations going in that have no connection, 
utilities, us, everybody else has no control from a future proofing perspective and that's where issues to the grid will take place. Uh, next product, um, Smart 2, uh, you'll see this at a lot of our Cadillac Fairview locations um, and Canadian Tire locations. It's more kind of heavy traffic retail, higher vandalism prone. The reason why it's more vandalism prone is we have a, uh, again, a proprietary system which actually has a locking door over the connector head. So you wouldn't put these into multi-res. Okay, even in the visitor parking, put the Core Plus in because it, it, is, it is a cheaper uh, method. Um, the reason why we've developed this, and especially the locking door, um, we were seeing theft of the, the cables way early on in like 2012, 13. Um, and we were figuring it was because people were cutting the cable to sell the copper. Um, and it just kept happening and happening and happening. So we put in video cameras in two of the highest, most prone um, uh, locations. Um, and within two days, we saw, or sorry, within two months, we saw exactly what was happening. It was electrical contractors with their branding on their trucks pulling up, cutting the cable and taking it to another install where they've bought like a station from Home Depot or something, spent $500 and done, remember I said the 500 usage to 2,500 usage sessions. Their customers were calling saying the charge not working they were going snapping our cables and taking it back to the customers location installing them and charging them like two or three hundred dollars one of the main reasons why we did this not even not even stealing for the for the copper right uh, the other piece is because of all the freezing rain and the snow and stuff that that we experience uh, in Canada um, this door will not freeze okay so in any environment it can be opened and it only opens upon successful authentication of the actual station okay um, the other key aspect, again, like the Core Plus, we have multiple different uh, deployment methods, okay? Um, you'll see, you may have uh, heard our, our announcement, um, our most recent flagship piece in the United States is with the city of LA. They deployed 75 of these on light poles because they did a light, a light pole LED retrofit upgrade and they actually had 208 running to the, to the light standard. So they've installed 75 of these directly on the light poles and connected into the available power. Um, LA, not the safest area in the world. So they were looking for a super, super rugged charger. Um, and that's why they selected this one. A key benefit to it too is um, this blue head, right? It can be swapped hot. So I can, if something happens to uh, a charger, we can send a tech out and they open up the security door. There's two security set screws. They pull those set screws out. This unit slides out. They plug a new one back in. They get back in their truck. They're serviced within 10 minutes. So from a safety perspective, that's a big thing that we look at too, is how can a tech be in the safest environments? We're the only one with a hot swappable unit on the market. So every connection, all your electrical, connections are actually done in the gray blue areas of either the wall mounts or the pedestal mount. So again, just different things that we obsess over from a usability perspective and from a safety perspective. The quad is cool. You see these happening in, again, kind of side to side, back to back spots. So you can put it right in the middle of the, the four spots. Again, it reduces down to only needing one conduit to run to each of those. So you're reducing your overall infrastructure cost. And then it's just nicer because it's angled into each parking spot, right? You're not fiddling, you're not going around, you're not fighting with things. The Smart2 curbside, again, it's called curbside, but we're seeing a lot of um, commercial investors and a lot of commercial properties installing this just because of the overall height. All of our cable management is counterweight. So even on the Core Plus cable management, it's counterweight. We don't use spring loaded retraction systems, okay? With spring-loaded springs are trained to retract no matter how extended it is. So on a spring, what it does is it puts negative tension on the connector head and the vehicle. That's where, again, you get a lot of uh, re reduction in longevity of life. When it's counterweight, it's relying on the weight of the cable to actually give it a natural sag so it never puts that negative strain and negative pull on the connector head and onto the vehicle. So again, longevity in market is that much greater. Um, the cables have been specifically designed as well for cold weather. So you know when we're putting up our, our lights during holiday time and the yellow, the yellow cord gets really, really brittle? Right? That happens with the majority of uh, charging stations as well. So it's kind of really cumbersome, hard to connect in. Ours have the same flex in minus 45 as they do in plus 30. Okay, so it's a really, really easy system. So um, a, lot of, a lot of people will just put the curb stops in, okay, um, or bullards. 
Um, a lot of times it depends on the engineering company, right? If they, if they obsess about it. So Cadillac Fairview, for example, in their locations, made me go four and a half feet down in the, in the, in the ground and put a full entrenched bullard in, right? Because of just their, their requirements. Canadian Tire, I can bolt them into the ground. Right? So it just, it just really depends on the, the overall aspect. Um, on wall mounts, you can put the, uh, I don't know what you call it, but the, you know, the, like the steel shroud, shroud yeah, uh, protection. Um, some people don't put anything, right? Um, um, they, they, we see less stations getting backed into than we see uh, snow plows taking these things out. Like every, every winter, we get a snow plow that takes off that big fridge DCFC unit completely off of, off of its structure. Rips right out of the power, everything. No idea how they do it, but they do it. Uh, same thing with this one. Um, we have over a thousand of these installed in the city of Montreal. Um, there's uh, actually soon to be deployed in Toronto here. Uh, they're in Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo. Uh, we've got them in Vancouver, basically all over the place. Um, but that same type of head system where it can be swapped and plugged in without having to flip a breaker and taking time on the, on the overall tech side of things. Um, the other piece with this is it's the only station on the market that you can integrate a utility meter into. Okay, so you can put a, actually a, a meter in the back of, of our master unit um, and then you can cascade off. So remember I gave that example of running a 200 amp service into the first one. Same thing happens with this one because the idea and concept is to put them down parallel park locations as EV adoption grows and grows and grows to give more optimal parking area. All the same stuff. So every one of our chargers in the field has the exact same screen, okay? Um, we don't do TV screens. Okay, so you'll see chargers and people saying you need a TV screen, you need a TV screen. We don't do TV because, we're, again, we're developing for super, super cold climate. Um, and the TV screens, what we find is they're more prone to failure. We're not interested in failure. We're interested in uptime. So we use a very small screen. The fact of the matter is, as an EV driver, you only ever look at that thing for less than five seconds. Because in the majority of cases, before you get out of your vehicle, you're activating the charger from your cell phone. Okay, so I can activate the charger in a warm car at minus 45 degrees, get out, take the connector in, plug in, and go. I never look at that thing. So it's just another reason why. We don't actually hard, our stations don't have to be actually hardwired, so cat five together. Um, um, and we'll, we'll show that in a, in a couple of pieces. We have a, a, a communication gateway that gets installed. Typically, as you go uh, lower and lower and lower below ground, what happens is they install the primary gateway on level one, okay, either, yeah. Yeah, it's a, Bell, it's a Bell 4G LTE chip, or it can be Rogers, or it can be TELUS. It gets installed, and then generally a CAT5 is run to a slave gateway on each floor, and then it communicates up and out. CAT5 never gets run to each machine. Each machine is, has a Zigbee antenna in it, okay? And that Zigbee antenna talks to each station, back to the slave, and then back up to the master, and out to our network operations center. So it's a, it's, a, it's a communication gateway. It's like that big. They, the electric contractor installs it in an eight by eight PVC box, right? And that connects to all the stations. You can go as far as 150 feet to your first station and then 150 feet after each station because of the way that the Zigbee antenna communicates to each one of the charging stations. So single residential, we don't use Zigbee. We don't use anything wireless. What we use is this, the smart station comes with a, a PLC uh, modem that gets plugged into your standard wall outlet by your internet modem. And then that piece gets connected in with CAT5 to your modem. And then actually the, the communication between the station and out to the internet is going through your power lines. Okay, so over 50% of our residential chargers are installed outside. So now you're, if you're going through Wi-Fi, you're going through brick, you might be going through steel, you're going through wood, you start to lose uh, wireless signal. On PLC, you have no issue no matter how far you're going. Okay, so it's a more guaranteed way, and then it just aspecting out to uh, the internet from, from your home router. Okay, so it's never from a security perspective. A lot of condo operators, condo boards, uh, workplaces get worried about connecting this stuff into their um, internet infrastructure, right? From a security perspective, it doesn't touch their infrastructure at all unless you're getting into the BMS integration. Uh, DC fast chargers, again, usually within a kilometer of a major highway exit, these are getting installed at. Um, they're expensive, okay? Um, the average install in Ontario for a DC fast charger is 80,000 to 180,000. 
Uh, so I say average because it's so big of a range. That's just for civil and electrical works. And then this station is about $42,000. So your payback on it to like a private investor is about seven to 10 years. Enercan has funds that will fund up to $50,000 per DCFC put into the ground. Um, but when you think about how long a user is connected in, that 18 to 21 minutes, it's prime optimal areas for convenience stores, for uh, coffee shops, because they're connecting in, they're going in, getting their coffee, coming back and getting in their vehicle and, and moving on. The average driver connects into a DC fast charger once a month. So it's not like the, the, every driver is using them readily all the time because of the overall cost. But if you're looking at it just from a business case of the charging station, it's a horrible business case, right? Seven to 10 years, you might break even. When you look at it from what kind of traffic it's driving in for that 18 to 21 minutes, then you can relate it back to the profitability on the sales coming into the, into the location. And that's how the Canadian tires of the world and the Cadillac Fairviews have, have seen the investment go, is they've got the eyes of that individual. And right now, especially, it's, it's typically higher income earners that are driving the vehicles. Um, so they're, they're spending a little bit more in the, in the stores. Um, so that's why this stuff is becoming so prevalent in, in a lot of uh, commercial settings. Uh, same thing, I won't go too far into this, but a hell of a lot more power, right? 480 VAC, it's typically connected into a 75 kVA transformer at minimum, and this is really where you need the utility um, support, and especially on the multi-res. As infrastructure grows and demand for parking spots and chargers grow, uh, this same amount of power will be pulled when you put in 10 charging stations, right? 10 level twos, same amount of power, right? So that's where you think about the, um, the power sharing and the power limiting and, and bringing that aspect in to, to protect the load. How do you activate? Um, on the Flow network, um, they can activate from mobile phone. We also have an RFID card, okay? Um, we, the, our RFID cards are the size of a credit card, okay? Um, a lot of our competitors use a keychain. So a key fob, we get a lot of complaints why the hell are our cards so big? Um, they don't wanna put them in their pocket, they'd rather put them on their keychain. Uh, the reason why is again, we're developing for cold weather. So the antenna in that card is four times the size as an antenna in a keychain fob. And in the super, super cold environments, that uh, antenna actually shrinks. So when a lot of users are activating via card, especially if you're going down like five floors in, in multi-res, um, the, at the, the RFID card will always activate the station, okay? And connect back into our network operations center. Uh, if you have sometimes cell phone signal loss and issues, that's where you have some trouble activating the station. So actually 80% of our drivers activate chargers typically, especially in winter, from the RFID card over their, their mobile app. Just depends on, on the user and if you're on Freedom or if you're on Bell and you've got stronger signal with Rogers, um, it's just a protection layer. Um, the proactive monitoring support, we monitor every charging station, including our connected charging stations for residential marketplace. So we're always looking at what's happening, what's going on. We can proactively reach out to the EV driver if we're seeing issues. So in many cases, an EV driver won't know that something's going wrong. We can tell typically if it's a charger or if it's their vehicle and give them recommendations on what to do to go back to the OEM and see uh, what the issues are. Um, we have a roaming agreement with ChargePoint. So ChargePoint is our closest competitor. Uh, they're, the largest, um, they're the largest network operator in North America. We're number two in North America. They own the US market, we own the Canada market. But to make it simple again for the EV driver, if I have a ChargePoint app, I can activate a flow station. If I have a flow app, I can activate a charge point station. So just making it simpler from the overall um, architecture. All the billing uh, and data, um, the site host, owner, operator, um, the building management side of things has access to that data. How, how many people are connecting in, how many kilowatts have been delivered, how much revenue has been collected. Um, you can see our stations in service, are they out of, station, out of service, are they being worked on right now. Um, you have full in real time uh, display through our, through our dashboards, okay? Um, everything is PCI compliant as well. Um, and it works very similar to your Starbucks card or your Tim Hortons card where you put $20 on it and you go in and you buy your $2 cup of coffee or your $6 one at, at Starbucks um, and it takes that credit off of the, the account. It works the same way on our network and then we remit back the 85% on a quarterly basis to the, to the site host and owner. How to use the network? Again, this is our number one call driver into our call center. 
um, for any type of EV driver. Um, so we take them through activating and seeing the stations. You can see all the stations in real time so you can plan your route through the mobile app. Um, also RFID card activation, uh, the mobile app activation. At the end of every session, the EV driver gets a receipt showing how much they've spent. We remit taxes on your behalf as well. Um, so they have a full, full receipt outlining the, the usage statistics. You also get that data in the, um, in the CSNMS, so your, your control panel dashboard. Um, so it's, everything is really, really tracked and in, in, in fully compliant with uh, the, the local laws uh, throughout North America. Um, the reason why we don't do credit card so a lot of people say, why don't you have credit card swipe terminals on the charging stations? It goes back to cost, right? The, you're transacting on level two, it's like a dollar, two dollars. And Visa doesn't like that, right? MasterCard doesn't like those small, small amounts. So it costs a heck of a lot more. The other piece to it is in EV charging, um, I can go and I can connect in a metal coat hanger into the connector and I won't get electrocuted. So I'm not worried if my three-year-old ever takes the charging connector in my garage and even puts his tongue to it. There's no power going to it unless it gets connected into the vehicle. And there's only power that it's delivered from upon handshake securities from the vehicle and this equipment. So it goes through on a DC fast charger about six handshakes. I feel you connected, I've got you locked. Now, are you grounded? Is there issues? How much power can you give me? How much continuous power can you give me? Vehicle, are you grounded? And only after it goes through those security checks does it push power into the vehicle. Okay, and that can take up to two minutes, two and a half minutes on a DC fast charger. So what, what credit card companies are used to is you swipe your card, the transaction's done within five seconds, right? Because it's a single dollar value. It's the $100 for the shoes, it's the $150 for the hotel room. In this stuff, what's happening is it's cycling while the activations in those security checks are going through. So it's sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes a minute, sometimes two minutes. The credit card transactor, after typically 15 seconds, starts to say, hmm, there might be something malicious going on here. And then they cut the connection, and they've cut the, the charge now, and a user is saying, okay, I need to try to reactivate. They tap their credit card again. It does the same thing. Maybe the transactor says the same thing. This is abuse. Now they've locked out the credit card, and you've got the user standing there stranded. Not only can they not charge, but they can't even use their credit card anymore. Okay, so there's so much different, different aspects to EV charging that you have to take into account of why credit card uh, terminals are not on the, on the stations readily right now. Uh, network services, um, so to get all of these things connected, there is a global management service and that provides all the proactive monitoring, all the 24-7 driver support. Every charger in the market has a toll-free number on it um, and a unique identifier on the charger. So this would be both in multi-res and in public environments. Um, so if there is any issues, drivers can call directly in, identify the charger and we can tell that into that charger to see any issues. We can also remotely activate it for the user. So we never strand a user. So if it's a new driver, we can activate the station on their behalf. We can take credit card payment over the phone if the site host wishes. Um, there's a number of different, different aspects that we can do. Um, it includes all of the data reporting, all the billing services, all of the firmware and software updates, the power sharing, the power limiting side, um, our warranties. They come with a one-year manufacturer warranty. It's parts and labor. Um, there is additional warranties that can be tacked on for up to five years. Um, and it's like $50 for a charging head, so it's kind of like a, like a TV buying um, from the warranty. But again, it's parts and labor. On DC fast charging, um, uh, never buy a DC fast charger without an extended warranty at minimum five years and an extended service plan. If, if somebody tries to sell you a DC fast charger that doesn't have that, don't buy it. Um, we won't sell a DC fast charger to somebody if they're not willing to buy the extended warranty and the maintenance plan. The reason why is because there's so much more that goes wrong with these things, right? Because there's so much more onboard power modules, cooling systems, they need to be maintained. Um, and, and you need to keep that kind of uptime, otherwise your lives will be, be hell with getting complaints. On the infrastructure side of things, um, we won't go too, too deep into this stuff, um, but it explains kind of what we talked about with the 4G LTE uh, connection points, our backnet systems, our power sharing systems, everything is away from your primary uh, area. We have a lot of partnerships with third party mapping systems. So the flow network is displayed on uh, third party mapping systems directly in the vehicles, like in the Nissan Leaf, for example, um, so they can plan their route. Um, the third party networks, like we talked about, 
about earlier, uh, uh, an individual from Quebec can literally drive to BC with their electric circuit card because we have roaming uh, agreements with all of our sister networks so they don't need multiple cards, multiple accounts. Um, we actually see a spike at our Milton location uh, during, during um, August and then April when individuals are driving from Quebec to drop their kids off at Western. They use Milton as a, as a stopping point so you can even tell things like that in your metrics that you have as far as reporting who's coming to your stations in public and kind of um, kind of go based on a, on a certain demographic segment. We don't provide who the person actually is though, right? So we can't provide any contact details, but you can see um, uh, their, their ID number, which is not identifiable to the customer or you in, in any way. So there's two, there's two ways to look at EV charging right now. There's companies like us in ChargePoint, which are vertically integrated, meaning we manufacture the charging stations, we also run the networks, and the network is, is ours from a software perspective. And then on the other side of this, there is software providers that have network solutions, right? And then there's hardware manufacturers that tie into those networks, okay? So two, two different pieces. The benefit to the vertically integrated side is, um, we have different tie-ins to all heartbeats in the actual charging charging station. So if there's an issue even down to the smallest little circuit board or to the cable, I know remotely um, without having to send a tech out to figure out what's going wrong with the station. Okay, You don't get that in the other tier of network operator over here and hardware provider over here because they don't have that same kind of uh, marriage between the hardware and the software. So when you're looking at this and assessing it, that's where the uptime comes into to play. So go back to what I said at the beginning where uptime for us is the most important aspect of the actual service itself. Um, in a vertically integrated service and solution, it's the only way that you can really minimize, um, or sorry, maximize uptime, reduce minimum uh, mean time to repair and mean time between failures. Our level two product has a mean time between failure of over 20 years right now because we're three nines and we obsess so much about the uptime. Um, um, and that is part because we do everything uh, vertically integrated and, and vertically focused, where on the other side, it would be dependent on what the network vendor provides from a solution and what the hardware charging station manufacturer allows for them to connect into the, into the different segments. So in, more infrastructure design and requirements. So we talked about the uh, level two side of things. So it can either be a split phase uh, 120, 240 VAC or three phase 120, 208. Um, so we can connect in in very different ways. Um, all of our charging stations have three times the amount of working space in them for the electrical uh, contractors than our nearest competitors, right? So again, we want to make their lives easier. We want to make them enjoy actually installing the stations. Um, and everything can be installed either below or through the back. So if you're doing wall installations and new builds, you can run conduit directly out uh, from, the, from the wall and plan that to keep everything looking really nice. Or a lot of times you'll run a, uh, run a, um, uh, a solid conduit and then flex conduit uh, into the actual bottom of the station or when it's connected into the pedestal um, it goes through the back to keep everything really really clean okay we talked about the power sharing requirement so um, power sharing typically in public chargers right one-to-one -one, give them full power so at your visitor spots at your common area spots provide full power because it's, it's really expected uh, you get into the power sharing on the per breaker level which would provide less less power over time, but again, it's as robust from a, from a, a, a retrofit perspective um, and, a, and a lot more uh, costly or cost efficient. And then the power sharing at the panel level based on the um, um, actual breakers. Okay, overall that kind of smart solution of power sharing, power limiting, uh, it reduces capital costs significantly because you're not bringing in other services. Uh, the reason why I say, especially in multi-residential, to work with your utility is many utilities are willing to um, provide more support and more infrastructure into the building. So for example, we're working on a, on a project with Burlington Hydro and Paradigm, uh, the new uh, three-tier uh, condo that just went in on, on Brant Street in Fairview, where Burlington Hydro has actually deployed a dedicated, um, a, a de a dedicated utility transformer 
transformer specifically for charging stations. So literally they can wire 100% of that building uh, with charging stations and it not affect the actual building capacity at all. So many utilities are willing to work with you guys when you're, when you're building out to help with that infrastructure uh, investment and to really, really expand it and enhance it. Um, so they become really your best friends. Over 70% of our business is through utilities and through municipalities. So you really do need that relationship with them. And part of the reason why the Liberal government did what they did early on um, when they basically said if, it, if you've had your project approved within the last three years, you're grandfathered. Um, and now from that perspective of you're not grandfathered in to design for the 80%, um, that's where a lot of that comes in. So if you're not working with them early, there definitely will be issue. Um, um, if you're working with them early, they can plan for that capacity. Like even the CEO of, of Toronto Hydro has, has said, yeah, we have enough capacity to hit, to hit every, every location. But it has to be done smart. If it's not done smart, we're all, we're all in, in big trouble. And we're becoming in big trouble too from a retrofit side on uh, single, single residential because people are plugging in chargers and they're not connected so the utility has no idea about them. And you go back to that kind of uh, transformer side of things and there are transformers blowing because now you've got five Teslas in the neighborhood you're seeing you're seeing a lot of that issue right so um, that's where we've kind of consulted with the government and, and Enercan especially on this of, of uh, people should not be allowed and really they're not now deploying a DC fast charger if they don't have utility support and the utility on board because you need that planning. Um, and the same goes from the multi-res. Um, if the utility is not actively involved with you guys, that's where the, the trouble's gonna, gonna hit. Yeah, but from a retrofit side of things, like I said, if you've done your LED retrofits and your HVAC upgrades and that type of thing, we are seeing, seeing capacity. Um, where, it, where it becomes an issue right now too is, Everybody, like I said, expects fast power, right? And, and that's the issue that you come against is when they hear you're only gonna give them eight amps, they freak out and say, that's not gonna be enough, but you're parked for 10 hours. It's plenty of power to get you to your, your, next, your next journey, right? And that's what we're fighting with, right? So if, if we educate and continue educating, we're gonna be educating for like five years. We do a ton of social media outreach. We do a ton of community engagements on those size levels, it makes your lives a lot easier and it'll make the utility lives a lot easier on the development. It's my personal opinion that us as manufacturers shouldn't be able to manufacture non-connected charging stations, right? Because it's, just, it's, uh, it's up to us just as much as it's up to the utility to make and protect the infrastructure that is being deployed to, to future-proof. Utilities are very, very willing, are very, will, very willing. On a retrofit, that's where Enercan is really gonna kick in and help out. Okay, and that's why I think where the, where the fund is coming from is part of the reason why they haven't done it. They've wanted to do it for like two and three years. They, they've had funds available for so long, but it's, it's part of that retrofit side. They've tried to break down those, those hurdles because it is, it is super costly, right? And you've got, you've got utilities. So we're working on a program with Electra right now. Electra um, in their jurisdictions has been approved with the IESO and with Natural Resources Canada to do a pilot program for a multi-residential for five to 10 multi-residential retrofit buildings to fully learn the impacts of those upgrades on the transformers. And that's using our technology as well and with in, in balance from a from a demand response and, and BMS side um, so those structures and if you're interested in that give me your give me your cards and I can bring you into to those discussions because we're going to be approaching retrofit uh, condos very very shortly um, but those programs are going on and ongoing uh, from the utilities to learn those aspects and to see where they have to go um, on the deployments Canada has been a little more stringent, right, from the from the Measurement Canada side of things of of how they how they see billing. So the way that it's been mainly right now is we're not providing electricity, you're providing a solution, right? And that's where the hourly comes in or the uh, per session. Um, this time last year, Measurement Canada was still seeing if you said for the first two hours you could charge a dollar fifty, and then for anything after that you could charge five dollars. They were kind of still seeing that as selling electricity in a different way. So we didn't have that, um, that flexibility. Um, so what we're releasing in Q2 of this year is that flexibility to say um, from, from one hour to two hours, it's X price. From three hours to 10 hours, it's an increased price. Um, even from a demand response side, we're working on part of that Electra program. What will happen is um, 
they will be demand response by the transformer and as well as the BMS system through the Imbala um, uh, trigger. And let's say a user comes home and it's during peak day and they have to charge, right? Because they're going somewhere at night and they don't want to be impacted. On the app, they'll be able to say, yeah, I'm willing to spend more or pay more for the service to ensure I get the full power. But so take me out of that program and keep the rest in. So there's lots of those flexibility pieces going and it helps with that overall kind of impact, right? What we're learning when, we, when we've gone into the States, parking lot owner operators are a lot more obsessive about that. So they want cars out within like two hours to four hours. Um, they're actually starting to put in valet services for EVs where they're hiring a person and to, to basically jockey the cars every two hours and they're charging like $20 for that two hour time period on top of the parking side of things to get people out, but to get people in because they want to push, push so much out. Um, that's why I say too, don't, don't do this stuff for free right because that's where you'll get abuse even charging 25 cents from our from our studies and our tests even charging 25 cents reduces abuse by over 80 percent so that aspect of it and early on it was well i've invested in an ev i deserve free electricity well the infrastructure costs a hell of a lot for you guys to deploy and for us to deploy it shouldn't it shouldn't be free and free just promotes promotes the abuse so we've seen some 50 60 year buildings that have a massive amount of, of available power yeah. Um, so it, it's part of that learning aspect of working with the utilities and Nanarcan and the ISOs of the world to really kind of see just how much is available. Um, we're seeing it more of, of a strain in, in single res, uh, like I went back to, but it, it'll all be a, a very much a, a learning experience for the next, I would say, 36 months. If you have your own submetering system, most buildings didn't want to go through with running like separate CAT to each one of the submeters. So a lot of times there's been a few projects where they've run new submeters dedicated to the EV charging station. But again, that just increases cost. So it's almost not worth, worth doing. There's been a few, but not too many. Like we're all sitting around the, the table with Measurement Canada, with the ISOs, with the OEBs on, on um, allowing for kilowatt hour pricing, right? Because our onboard measurement side of things is within like 0.2% accuracy of the industry approved uh, meters. So everything is there already. There's no need to re-architect the charging stations to be able to plug a meter in um, because it's so exact. So we're working together. I think we're gonna see something drop in probably less than 18 months to be able to charge by the kilowatt hour. That again though, will be a new education for EV drivers because everybody thinks that if we can charge by the kilowatt hour, it's gonna be the same price that they pay at home. 12 cents, 13 cents, 15 cents during on peak yet You've got to maintain these things. There's infrastructure investment that you want to recoup. So you'll probably want to charge 25 cents per kilowatt hour, right? Because of all that stuff. So it'll just be new education, but it will make it more fair for EV drivers because that Chevy Bolt or the Chevy Volt, which has a smaller battery, smaller onboard charger, only gets about uh, 15 kilometers per hour being connected in at full power, where the Tesla gets 35 kilometers per hour at full power. So was it fair to charge the dollar fifty right now an hour. It's the only way we can do it. Um, but it will it will become more fair. It will make it easier too for condos and for apartments to uh, actually deploy the solutions and actually get to that kind of submetering side on billing. Because right now the way that you can do it is like that kind of cell phone plan or internet plan, flat monthly fee for the for the service um, to get around to get around those infrastructure pieces, the pricing pieces.